Hello, everyone. This is the 41st episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. We are pleased to have Mr. Franco Spicciarello back on our podcast. We continue our interview series with Mr. Spicciarello as we discuss the matches of the Italian national team during the 1984-85 season. Last time we left off in the summer of 1984 with Italy taking part in a North American tour with matches versus USA and Canada. The 1983-84 season had been disappointing as Italy had been starting since winning the World Cup in 1982. The disastrous 1984 Euro qualifiers ended in the fall of 1983. As defending World Cup champions, Italy didn't have to deal with World Cup qualifiers. And starting the new year, 1984, they were restricted to friendly matches for two years until the World Cup. Long-serving manager Enzo Bierzot had slowly started to inject some new blood in an aging side. This new season, 1984-85, while the other European nations started their respective World Cup qualifiers, Italy continued to prepare for the World Cup by continuing to play in friendlies. Franco, welcome back. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for hosting me again. Thank you. We start off the season on September 26 at San Siro at Milan as Italy took on Sweden in a friendly. Remember, Sweden had defeated Italy twice in 1983. So this was a good test. For this match, Enzo Bierzot was still unsatisfied for the goalkeeping position as Ivano Bordon and Giovanni Galli had been tried without much satisfaction as it was a struggle to replace Dino Zoff. So for the first time, for his first cap, Enzo Bierzot selected Roma goalkeeper Franco Tancredi, who had played in the 1984 Olympics. The rest of the side for this match were Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Antonio Cabrini, Juventus, right back, left back, Fulvio Colovati of Inter, who would be replaced by Ubaldo Rieti of Roma in the 85th minute, capping the side Gaetano Shirea of Juventus. Pietro Vierkovod of Sampdoria played in the number four role, so I'm assuming he was a defensive midfielder for this match. Berzot decided to play kind of a 5-3-2. Oh, so quite defense, weird, yeah. trying to cover a lot, like then he was going to do in the last game of the World Cup 86 with Giuseppe Baris instead of Di Gennaro. Oh, I see. And then to cover the defense. He was uh, a little bit worried about uh, Olmquist, Svensson, and then Corneliusson. Oh, I see. Then in midfield, you have Bruno Conti of Roma. He'd be replaced by Pietro Fana of Verona in the 15th minute. I presume he was injured. Salvatore Bagni of Napoli. He had joined Napoli that season along with Maradona. Then you have Paolo Rossi of Juventus. For the regista role, you have Giuseppe Dosena of Torino. He was replaced by Marco Tardelli of Juventus in the 62nd minute. Up front, Alessandro Altobelli of Inter. Now I'll quickly go through the Swedish side as well. You have Bernd Leung of AIK. Ingemar Erlandsson, captain the side from Malmo. Glenn Heisen, future Fiorentina, future Liverpool player. At this time, he was at PSV Eindhoven in Holland. Sven Dahlqvist of AIK. Stig Fridriksson of IFK Gothenburg. Ulf Eriksson of Aris Salonika in Greece. Tord Holmgren of IFK Gothenburg. Glenn Stromberg of Atalanta in Serie A. He joined Atalanta that season from Benefica. And I mean, Ben's a hero. He's a yes. hero over there. Yes. And he was set it for eight, eight years until yeah. 1992. Then you have Jan Svensson of Eintracht Frankfurt in West Germany. He replaced by another Serie A player, Dan Corneliuson, who I joined Como, the newly promoted Como that season in the 56th minute. You have Hans Holmquist of Fortuna Dusseldorf in West Germany and Mats Gren of IFK Gothenburg in a side managed by Lars Arneson. 
for this match, Italy scored a winning goal as early as the second minute. Bruno Conti took a free kick from the left side and Cabrini headed it in. That was enough for Italy to win this match. What do you remember from this? Well, we need to take a little step back because we were coming from the previous season where the Italian Championship had been won by Juventus. Roma arrived to the final of the Champions Cup, which they lost at penalty kicks against Liverpool. So those were the best teams of the country at the moment, but we were entering the season 84-85, which was going to be the season of the surprise, the first Scudetto won by Verona, with second seat that went to Torino. Two kind of uh, outsiders, but let me say, the legend keeps saying that that has been the only season in Serie A history in which the referees have been chosen by Ballot. They're not be appointed for a specific game. So maybe it's just a case, just a connection. Who knows? But that's exactly what happened. Anyway, you know, Berzot kept being a little bit too grateful with his senators and he stayed really, really indecisive with the new people that he, he wanted to bring in. First, as you said, Bordon, Tancredi, and Galli. For all the friendlies in preparation to World Cup 86, he kept alternating all of them, even doing the same game. Possibly, now we know it's kind of one of the worst mistakes, especially for a goalkeeper. In defense, there was a problem that was emerging with Gaetano Scherea. Still a great libero, but he was not anymore in his prime, obviously. There was Franco Baresi that was really blossoming as the best libero of the country, but, you know, Berzot couldn't touch Gaetano Scherer. He was now the new captain. He was really somebody who was respected by everybody. But then he started to play Baresi sometimes as a central midfielder in the back. Covering the defense was really not, not his role. On the right, Bergomi kept growing. Really was something certain for Berzot, as also Bjerkovod in the role of the stopper, central as a central defender, marking the, the striker of the other team. On the left, Antonio Cabrini was still a top player, as he was going to show during this preparation, this friendlies. And then even during the World Cup, it was still good. And But again, there was Kolovati. He stayed in the team. He stayed in the group. He even went to World Cup 86. But it was really, his time was quite over. And in fact, he was replaced by Ubaldo Righetti that seemed to emerge as a, a new great possibility for the future, but it never became what everybody expected from him. Midfield, Bruno Conti, this one was possibly his last top season. And in fact, especially this game and another game, he showed really his class, his capacity to provide assist. Also because... Berzot decided to replace Giancarlo Antonioni, which was plagued by injury that year. Then he broke his ankle in a very bad way during the championship. But he tried to bet on Di Gennaro, not in this game, where against, again, Dosena was picked as a central midfielder, as a regista in some way. But let me say that Dosena never really got along with Enzo Berzot. He was possibly the most technical, the most classy midfielder in those years, you know, playing for teams like Torino, like Bologna, like Sampdoria. And let me tell you that it was a time in which, if you were not really playing for Juventus, Inter, AC Milan, in those years, maybe for S Roma, you were not going to find uh, some certainties uh, in terms of role in the, in the Azzurri. It was like that. It was already like that in the early 70s and it stayed like that for a while. It's, it's been changing the last 20 years also because, you know, with all the foreigners in the championship, those kind of blocks like it was for Juventus in 1982 where you had eight players coming from Juventus was changed. So that game uh, was a typical Italy game. Bruno Conti from the left, uh, cross uh, Cabrini that tend to enter the the area of the other team uh, during this kind of crosses. He set a goal with a header, and then Italy decided to defend for the rest of the game. As you can see, he even replaced Dosena with Tardelli. So basically covering completely, setting up a wall in front of Tancredi. So not a great game, but at least a victory that at least you could see some good signals, especially in the defense. 
but the worst was yet to come. Franco, do you know if this game was organised before or after the European Championship qualifiers? Was it to get some revenge on Sweden or was it a a game that had already been (laughs) organised? No, no, not revenge, but basically Berzot realised that Sweden, their way of playing was a problem for our team and that's why he asked the federation to set up another game with the Swedish. That was really okay. the reason. No, no, there's never yeah. bad blood with the, with the Swedish. Come on, nice guys. No, no, it's just a good <laughs> test. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, just to point out that this was the last match where Italy were their Lecoq sportive kit. This one? They won the World Cup, yes. This the one, one you're wearing right now, yes. Yep. So this was the very last match with that. We come to the next match. It's in November. On November 3rd, it's an away trip at Lausanne, Italy, taking on another friendly against Switzerland. For this match, Italy would be wearing their new Diadora kit for the first time. With the three stars. Yes. They would have Diadora until end of 1994, where I guess they would switch to Nike. For this match, Bierzot maintained Franco Tancredi of Roma as goalkeeper. A defensive line, you have Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Antonio Cabrini of Juventus, right back, left back, Pietro Vierkobod of Sampdoria, captain beside Gaetano Shira of Juventus, Salvatore Bani of Napoli, Bruno Conti of Roma, he replaced by Giuseppe Dosena of Torino in the 62nd minute, Antonio Savato of Inter, he replaced by Ubalto Rietti of Roma in the 77th minute. This was Antonio Sabato's fourth and final cap for Italy. And the only time he started. All his caps were in 1984. Then, new debutant and a new regista, Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, making his international debut. And he would be Italy's regista until the 1986 World Cup. Essentially replacing Giancarlo Antonioni as the regista of the national team. So then up front, you have Paolo Rossi of Juventus and Alessandro Altobelli of Inter. And let me quickly go through the Swiss lineup as well. You have Karl Angel of Neuchatel Zamax, Beat Rietman of St. Gallen, Marco Schalbum of Grasshopper, Heinz Hermann of Grasshopper, Alan Geiger of Servet, Captain beside Roger Verli of Grasshopper, Georges Breggi of Young Boys Bern, Michel de Castel of Servet, Beat Suter of Basel, he replaced by Christian Mate of La Chaux de Fond in the 62nd minute. Raimondo Ponto of Grasshopper. I believe he played at Nottingham Forest for like a season or so. Yeah, he yeah, was there briefly. Yeah. He replaced by Marcel Kohler of Grasshopper in the 87th minute. Hans Peter Zwicker of St. Gallen, he replaced by Manfred Braskler of St. Gallen in the 70th minute. The side managed by Paul Wolfisberg. So for this match, Italy took the lead in the seventh minute. It was almost a carbon copy of the goal yep. against Sweden, but this time from the right side. Yes, yes. Conti from the right side. So it was a free kick. Free and kick, kick yeah. and, Cabrini and again, header. Cabrini enter. And uh, with a header, it makes a 1-0. It seems like really a copy cat also because like the previous game, the Azzurri realized during the qualification for Euro 84 that every game was kind of a final battle for the other team. You know, you're the world champ. Everybody wants to win it, wants to make it, to show the world that it can be the world champions. So with this new cycle, in some way, they think they were ready. Also, there was kind of a new blood in the team. And also, Berzot seemed to start insisting on the same man. Tancredi, Bergomi, Cabrini... Bagni now fully replacing Marco Tardelli, but Tardelli was really past his prime completely. And in fact, he ended at the World Cup 86, like a very nice vacation to Mexico together with Paolo Rossi. Bagni was an extremely aggressive player as a central midfielder, but it's kind of weird because he started as a winger when he was young. He played also as a central striker. Also, when he was at Inter, then he started to change his role. And he was called at Napoli by Ottavio Bianchi to play basically to cover... Diego Armando Maradona, because he played with Maradona, Giordano, and Careca. 
So three players that were not really covering. So you needed somebody running for everybody. And really, Bagni, uh, when he was at, at the top of his career, was uh, impossible to go through. He, was, he could run uh, behind everybody. He was tackling everybody. Really, was everywhere on the field. The same like Vierkovod. Vierkovod always say, Van Basten always remembers that's the toughest player he ever that played against was Pietro Vierkovod, who, who used to beat him up all the time. But Vierkovod would say, yes, but, but Marco Van Basten too was beating me up as well. <laughs> so Bruno Gonti again, top of the game. Uh, and a finalist, uh, Di Gennaro starts. And the problem is that everybody was expecting another Antonioni. And uh, Berzot was not changing his way of playing. And now everybody knew how Italy was playing, you know, with uh, Cabrini keep going on the, on the left, Bergomi on the right, uh, Bruno Conti jumping from one wing to the other. But it was quite typical way of playing. The best news were about Alessandro Altobelli. that was really growing uh, in the top striker of the country. While Rossi, still good, but it was starting to go down, really. That season, uh, Juve was going to get to the final of the Champions Cup, possibly being uh, the last good season of Paolo Rossi. But not, a, not, but not a top one, for sure. So, and uh, again, Italy scored immediately. Then Bregi made it with a free kick on which Tancredi was a little bit late, which started to make Berzot losing a little bit of faith because, you know, Tancredi wasn't really tall. Kind of a 176, 78, something like that. It was, was short even at the time. Today, it would be extremely short, but at the time, goalkeepers were not two meters like today. There were a different way of training the players, and it was different. We started to defend after the first goal, 1-1, and uh, in the second half, nothing happened. The result was great in defending, but when it was the time to build a game, we were not there, especially if Conti was not in his best day. He was the only one with some fantasy on the imagination on the field. And Bregi scored in the 43rd minute, just before halftime. Yeah. And also, we should mention that Alto Belli scored a goal that was disallowed in the 21st minute. Yeah. 1 1 tie away from home. Italy would end the calendar year on December 8th at Pescara's Stadio Adriatico, taking on Poland, their semi final opponents from 1982. For this match, you have Franco Tancredi of Roma starting. Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter. He'll be replaced by another international debutant of the surprising Verona side, Roberto Tricella, in the 46th minute. Actually, Tricella had started at Inter. I don't know if he had started at Inter, but he had a very short time at Inter before he made his name at Verona and became an international player. And in a way, groomed to be the future liberal at some point. So then you have Antonio Cabrini of Juventus, Pietro Viercovo of Sampdoria, Ubaldo Rieti of Roma, starting in place of Shirea. You have Salvatore Bani of Napoli. He replaced by Giuseppe Dosena of Torino in the 61st minute. Bruno Conti of Roma. He replaced by Pietro Fana of Verona in the 70th minute. Capping the side, Marco Tardelli of Juventus. Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, Paolo Rossi of Juventus, Alessandro Altobelli of Inter. He replaced by another debutant, Aldo Serena of Torino in the 79th minute. Let me also quickly go through the Polish lineup. You have Jacek Kazimierski of Legia Varsa, Dariusz Kubicki of Legia Varsa, Vladislav Zemuda, captain the side from Cremonese in the Serie A, Roman Wojcicki of Vizio Lodz, Dariusz Wdocic of Legio Varsa, future Celtic Glasgow player, Jerzy Vihas of Vizio Lodz, Valdemar Matizic of Gornik Zabrze, he replaced by Valdemar Prusik of Slask Rokla in the 80th minute, Zbigniew Boniek of Juventus, Richard Komorniki of Gornik Zabrze, Andrzej Palaj of Gornik Zabrze, Miroslav Okanski of Lech Poznan, he replaced by Marek Ostrovski of Pogon Sechin in the 53rd minute, for side managed by Antoni Pieknicek. 
we should mention that Vodocic would be sent off in the 49th minute after double booking. For this match, Italy had to wait until the 77th minute before Altobelli gave him the lead. So essentially, from the middle, Pietro Fana sent a long cross in the box. Altobelli controlled it, held it up at the far post. And he then did the sombrero. Slide, yes. And slide it past on a ground level shot past uh, Kazimierski. And just before the end of the match, in the 90th minute, Di Gennaro scored from a very long range shot. Italy won 2 0, just like in a World Cup. Yeah, possibly the best game of this cycle. The team was pretty convincing. It started to look like a team. Altobelli started to feel like he was a real leader, a really overcoming Paolo Rossi. That the best thing about Paolo Rossi in that team was that everybody was still scared about him. So there were, he always had at least two players following him, everybody providing spaces for, for Bruno Conti, for Altobelli. So Altobelli was not well known at the international level, but really was pretty useless on the field otherwise. A couple of curiosity. Roberto Tricella was born in Cernusco sul Naviglio, which is a, a small 30,000 people town close to Milan, which is the same place where Gaetano Scirea, the libero he was going to replace, was born. And also another libero, Roberto Galbiati, he used to play for Fiorentina, Torino and Lazio in the same, the same times. It's pretty weird. It's called the, the city of the liberty for, <laughs> for some reason. They were all born there. And also on the other side, there was Muda, who had left Verona at the end of the season 84, and he moved to the New York Cosmos, which at the time were owned by then Lazio president, Giorgio Chinaglia. And then he moved back to Italy to play for Cremonese, also because the uh, Cosmos were running out of money. Boniek was obviously the star of the Polish team of those years. But let me tell you that Italy played against Poland about three times in uh, four years. Uh, and Boniek was never a star on the field. It seems like that he was suffering when he was playing against his uh, teammates of Juventus. But it was a very convincing game, especially by Di Gennaro. Aside from the goal at the last minute, he was in the right place, uh, sending... A very strong hit from about 25 meters, uh, but uh, he was really playing as the regista that Berzot was looking for. While on the right, there was Pietro Fanna, who was having the best season of his life. And fortunately, he was playing as a winger. The weird thing is that he grew up at Juventus with Giovanni Trapattoni. Then he moved again to Inter late in the 80s, playing again with Giovanni Trapattoni. But Trapattoni never wanted to play him on the wing for... We don't know which reason. It was never explained. Fana hated that because he had his best season playing on the right wing. He made the fortune of uh, Verona that, that season and also did very good things uh, with the shirt of the Azzurri. As you show here with his cross for, for Altobelli. We mentioned Verona who would win the Scudetto that season and you would see a number of Verona players playing this season with Tricella we mentioned, Fana, of course, and Di Gennaro, now and becoming then, integral parts of the team. And then Giuseppe Galdarisi was on his way. Oh, yes, yes, of Unfortunately. course. Nice guy. <laughs> I loved him. I met him uh, when I was, I was a kid when he started to play for Lazio, went out for dinner. But really, there's a story about him. He grew up in Juventus. He had a great season. He was uh, very instrumental for winning the championship in 81, 82, yes, 81, yeah, yeah. 81, 82. That's six season. goals, then, I think. Yeah. yeah, and some of them were very fundamental goals. Mm-hmm. Then he moved to Verona. When uh, Silvio Berlusconi bought AC Milan, he bought a lot of players. Uh, you know, brought these players on the field with the helicopter. It was really kind of start system, Hollywood coming to Serie A. He asked for advice to his friend of conflict on the Industrial Association, Giovanni Agnelli, the owner of Juventus. And Agnelli said, you know, you need a striker. You should get a very fast Giuseppe Galderisi. After one year, Berlusconi declared, I will never ask for another advice to Mr. Agnelli. <laughs> Galderisi, you know, nice guy, really, but uh, he had some attitude problems, uh, was never consistent on the field. Uh, that's why his career ended quite soon. In 87, he was playing with Lazio in Serie B. And even there, he only scored, I think, one goal. 
and honestly, then I lost trace of him after that. It was like 27. So yeah. too bad. I know he went to Padova. Yeah. And, and then, then he also moved to the United MLS. States in MLS yeah. for, with the revolution. Yes. The revolution. It wasn't that great there as well. But and uh, another one, World Cup of 86, uh, I, still, I have it, you know, in my pocket diary when I was in school. There was this uh, journalist going to Roberto Pruzzo. He was the top scorer of Serie A. He was not called for the World Cup like it had happened in 82. And uh, the journalist asked Pruzzo, what do you think of uh, Mr. Galderisi at uh, World Cup 86? And you could just see Pruzzo starting to laugh. <laughs> I don't know. Possibly it was uh, that he played for Juventus in the past. It was really one of the worst choices of Berzot in that cycle, unfortunately, because he was really a nice guy. We should also talk about Aldo Serena, another debutante. And this season, he was on loan from Inter to Torino, and he would have a very good season. You mentioned they would finish as runners-up. Now, Serena has played for so many clubs. I think he must be the only player who has played for both Inter and Milan in different spells and also Juventus and Torino. There's another Maybe one. Maybe Vieri. I think Vieri is probably the Vieri. best one. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And he played for many clubs. Bari. Bari. In, yeah. yeah. He was just very unsettled. Bounced from club to club. But, and uh, he, was, he was moving to Lazio in, this, in the summer of 84 because Lazio was selling Giordano and Manfredonia to Juventus. Part of the deal was Juventus getting Serena from Inter and selling him to Lazio together with Massimo Briaschi. But, you know, those things of the cultural mercado that never happened. And also, I have a problem when I see Serena because when I think about him, I think about... The penalty missing a penalty oh, in 1990. Yeah. Then he missed in 1990. My heart gets broken. <laughs> yeah, but a very good header of the ball. Yeah. Have to mention. And he was and great in uh, 1989 with Inter. Yes. It's called Capo the Inter of the record. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We come to the new year, 1985. On February 5th, Republic of Ireland hosted Italy at Dublin's Delhi Mount Park. Now, we discussed this match in our Republic of Ireland podcast. So there's a lot of stories contained in this match. There was a lot of controversy. The match was played at Delhi Mount Park and not Lansdowne Park, where, where it would have been better for the capacity that was expected. The game was delayed for like 15 minutes to accommodate the extra crowd. If you see highlights of the match, you can see there are fans near the touchlines. In fact, when players are taking corner kicks, you can see fans near them. The match was used as a pretext for a protest for about prison conditions, I believe. So there was this backdrop. In general, the Irish Federation did not look good for not anticipating such a large crowd against the defending World Cup champions. Now, getting back to the match itself. For this match, Bierzot selected Tancredi of Roma in goal, Bergomi of Inter, Cabrini of Juventus, Pietro Vierkovod of Sampdoria, Gaetano Shirea of Juventus. So this was the standard starting defensive formation for this season, for Bierzot. So Salvatore Bani of Napoli, Bruno Conti of Roma, He'd replaced by Giuseppe Dosena of Torino in the 72nd minute. Captain the side, Marco Tardelli of Juventus. I'm surprised Tardelli captain the side even though Shira was back. Or do I have that wrong? But I have on record Tardelli as the captain. You have Di Gennaro of Verona, Antonio Di Gennaro. Paolo Rossi of Juventus. He'd replaced by Aldo Serena of Torino in the 72nd minute. And Alessandro Altobelli of Inter up front. I'll quickly go through the Irish lineup. You have Paddy Bonner of Celtic, Glasgow in goal. Chris Hewton of Tottenham. Jim Beglin of Liverpool. Mark Lawrenson of Liverpool. He replaced by Paul McGrath of Man United in the ninth minute. Mick McCarthy of Man City. Liam Brady of Inter, who is playing against a couple of his teammates. Kevin Sheedy of Everton. Gary Waddock of Queen's Park Rangers. Tony Galvin of Tottenham. He'll be replaced by Ronnie Willen of Liverpool in the 29th minute. 
capping the side Frank Stapleton of Man United. John Byrne of Queen's Park Rangers, he replaced by Alan Campbell of Racing Santander in Spain, in a side managed by Owen Hand. For this match, in the fifth minute, Mark Lawrence tackled Altobelli in the box. And this actually led to Lawrence getting injured. So that's why he was replaced in the ninth minute by McGrath. Paolo Rossi was scored from a penalty kick. Paolo Rossi, possibly one of his last best games, was Paolo Rossi sending a filtering ball for Altobelli that went on the left. Oh, uh, right, right. Towards, yes. towards the, yeah. Yeah. Towards the area. So, yeah. And Italy doubled the lead in the 18th minute by Altobelli. So, again, Conti won the ball in the middle and sent Altobelli through, who cut in and then shot past Bonner. Ireland would get back in the game, and in the 53rd minute, they pulled the goal back through Gary Wadak. It was a respectable away win for Italy. Yeah, quite convincing game, by the way. Ireland is always kind of a tough opponent. Uh, some of these players were going to be on the field, I think, McGrath and Whelan, also later in 94 against Italy, when Italy lost 1-0 yes. yes. with, with a goal of Ray Oton. Very good game by Rossi and Altobelli again. Really, Altobelli was the star that year. And also in defense, where I would say Vierko gave a hard time for, to Frank Stepladon, which, by the way, was the one that gave the assist for the goal by Waddock. Yes, yes. I have to say that once again, uh, Tancredi arrived on the ball a little bit late. It was really not an irresistible shot by Waddock. Uh, and uh, Tancredi was really late also because it was from the left to the right, so uh, close to the post, but Tancredi didn't jump at the right moment. Uh, that was uh, kind of worrisome, and then I believe that at that point was kind of a turning point for Berzot to start to think about uh, that Giovanni Galli deserved the role between the posts. I think this game, John talked about, the quite chaotic with the, with the crowd, but it, it showed... Because there was so little football on telly, the chance to see the world champions, that was a huge thing. In the UK and Ireland, we really didn't get to see the, a lot of these players. So for them to be playing there, I certainly don't think Italy played in the Republic of Ireland too many times. This was a big thing. And to see those players, even though maybe from the Italian perspective, they were getting past their best, but the status of those players that had won the World Cup Conti and Tardelli and especially Paolo Rossi, that was a huge thing for British and Irish fans to to be able to see them. At this point, they were superstars of European and world football, so it, it just shouldn't be underestimated when now you're used to being able to see every player on television any night you choose to actually have those players playing there. You know That certainly explains why the crowd was as it was, although why the Irish FA couldn't see that was uh, another matter. Also, you know, Italy and Ireland uh, never really, I don't even remember before that game, another game. No, Italy. I, I can't remember, remember another fixture. Yeah. 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 Even uh, at, uh, you know, at club's level, I remember like a couple of years before there was a game, uh, Roma versus Ballinena, but it's Northern Ireland. So, uh, yeah, it was a very I understand, rare. Uh, no, the interest of, uh, you know, when you live in Ireland uh, without a real champ- top-level championship and not that much uh, football on TV. So I, I can understand uh, the people crowding the stadium in that way. Yeah, it's a big deal. Well, we still went to the stadiums. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Italy's next match would be on uh, March 13th at Athens against Greece. For this match, you have Franco Tancredi of Roma in goal, Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Antonio Cabrini of Juventus, Pietro Vierkovod of Sampdoria, Gaetano Schirea of Juventus, Salvatore Bani of Napoli, Bruno Conti of Roma, capping the side Marco Tardelli of Juventus. He replaced by Giuseppe Dosen of Torino in the 80th minute, Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, Paolo Rossi of Juventus, he replaced by the returning Bruno Giordano of Lazio in the 46th minute. 
Alessandro Altobelli of Inter, and he replaced by Pietro Fana of Verona in the 72nd minute. And I'll quickly just go through the Greece lineup. You have Nikos Karulias of Panathinaikos, Petros Mitros of Olympiakos, Stelios Manolas of AEK Athens, Ioannis Kiristas of Panathinaikos, Nikos Alavantas of Paok Salonika. He replaced by Nikos Patsiavuras of Larissa in the 87th minute. Savas Kufidis of Iraklis. Capping the side, Nikos Anastapoulos, future Avelino. At the time he was at Olympiakos. He replaced by Ioannis Valeoras of Larissa in the 81st minute. Kostas Antonio of Panathinaikos. He replaced by Georgios Semerzidis of Aris Thessal in the 73rd minute. Tassos Mitropoulos of Olympiakos. Dimitris Saravakos of Panathinaikos. He replaced by Kostas Batsilinas of Ethnikos in the 84th minute. In a side managed by Miltos Papapostulo. This was a dire match, very poor match. The press blaming Bierzot as always. Before the match, he'd been confident. Bierzot had said that after the recent wins, that the group that goes to Greece will be the one that will go to Mexico. But the Italians were so poor that the Greek press described them as a plate of spaghetti without the sauce. As always, the Italian press also complained. But Bierzot stated that, what do you want? Getting an away tie is not enough. And he also blamed the pitch conditions. I think it had been raining or it was raining at the time. He said that he had taken Rossi out because he had complained of his knee. And he had chosen Giordano to replace him instead of Serena because he felt that Giordano would be more capable of playing in what he described as a potato patch of a field. Horrible game, really. That reminded me of the one with Cyprus in the, in the European qualifying games. Horrible game against the Greece a team that was really, really bad. They only had a star on the field, which was Saravakos, a legend of Greek football. There was also close to be a player of Juventus and Fiorentina, I think, in 1991. 90, we got offered, I remember, it was especially Fiorentina was pretty serious about that. But then Calcio Mercado, 90% of the time, doesn't happen. Yeah. So Anastopoulos uh, as a central striker, always good when he was playing in Greece. Uh, I think is considered one of the worst players ever yes. to show up on the field in Italy. Really, I don't even, he didn't even look like a player. Yeah. And when he was at Avellino, it wasn't yeah. the team that was bad. It was him that was really bad. Yeah, 87-88 season. He's considered, yeah. yeah. He's always considered as one of the, as you say, Bidoni, one of the Bidoni, worst yes. foreign Trash players man. in Italy. <laughs> yeah. Like on the on the Azzurri side, uh, again, Paolo Rossi, always in the first 11, while he should have never been there, honestly. He decided to play Bruno Giordano. Bruno Giordano was the best replacement available in Italy for Paolo Rossi. Unfortunately, the season 84-85 was possibly the worst season of his career. Lazio had the worst season of his history, yes. ending uh, at the last spot of Serie A, together with Cremonese. And Giordano was, had a very bad season. So in some way, Berzot lost faith in him. And it clearly, if you're playing that bad in your club, you cannot play great with the, with the national team, unfortunately, because really Giordano had the right mindset. He really wanted to make it in the national team after having lost more than two years at the World Cup 82. There was going to be his own work, his World Cup, together with the Euro Championship in 1980. So he, he really wanted a revenge and he couldn't make it. And when he moved to Napoli the other year, for some reason, Berzot, uh, who after the Calcio's commission, never really forgave him. So he decided to drop him in some way. He gave him some chances, but never real ones. And uh, Alto Belli, still very good. But, you know, the day in which you have Bruno Conti, not in his best day, nothing happens on the field. Antonio Di Gennaro was a very honest regista, not a great one. Not even half of Antonioni. But here you can see how you still had the senators. You really, you could see some very good, 
players, but there was never a renewal. All these players could have been in the first 11 in 92 World Cup. While at the same time, you were having a great under-21 team that was going to win the Euro Championship, driven by Azzelio Vicini, who was also the assistant coach, together with Cesare Maldini or Berzot. And you had players like Roberto Mancini, Gianluca Vialli, that was going to end uh, at the uh, World Cup 86, but he could have played already here. Giuseppe Giannini in, uh, as a central midfielder that became uh, one of the first 11. Matteoli. The World Cup. Matteoli or Roberto Donadoni was really already showing great things with Atalanta. So it was the perfect replacement for Bruno Conti, which he became later. The problem is that Berzot never really believed in the young players, except for Bergomi, which in some way was just thrown on the field uh, during the World Cup uh, and then just became part of the of the group of his senators. Even if he was just uh, like 20 at that moment. It was really, we needed fresh blood. There was nothing that Berzot decided to do about it. He kept insisting on the same players. But let me say, this team, even its worst day, is like five times better than Italy of the last five years. <laughs> I can tell you. And this was like some of the worst <laughs> times of the Azzurri ever. But, you know, considering what the, the Azzurri level of the last even 10 years, let me say, we're talking about a different story. And unfortunately, we will never be there for at least for a while. Yes. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> Just a few weeks later, on April 3rd, at Ascoli, Italy took on Portugal. Now, this was Italy's 200th official international match at home. So for this match, Tancredi did not start for the first time. Giovanni Galli of Fiorentina started the match in goal. And Franco Tancredi of Roma would replace him in the second half. So you're already seeing that still Bierzot is not satisfied as far as who's going to be in goal. So then you have Giuseppe Bergome of Inter. He'd replaced by Fulvio Colovati of Inter in the 79th minute. Antonio Cabrini of Juventus. Pietro Viercovod of Sampdoria. Gaetano Schirea of Juventus. Salvatore Bani of Napoli. Bruno Conti of Roma. Capping the side, Marco Tardelli of Juventus, Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, Paolo Rossi of Juventus, and Alessandro Altobelli of Inter. He replaced by Pietro Fana in the 60th minute. Going through the Portuguese lineup, you have capping the side, Manuel Bento of Benfica, Joao Pinto of Porto, Augusto Inacio of Porto, Carlos Manuel of Benfica. He'll be replaced by Antonio Andre of Porto in the 84th minute. Yuriko Gomez of Porto. Bastos Lopez of Benfica. Morato of Sporting. Antonio Souza of Sporting. Fernando Gomez of Porto. He'll be replaced by Rui Aguash of Portimonense in the 73rd minute. Jaime Pacheco of Sporting, Diamantino of Benfica, and he pre- replaced by Jose Ribeiro of Academica de Coimbra in the 46th minute. It was yes. a great Portuguese side. Yes. You know, it was eliminated by France only at the extra time at the Euro 84 that was won by France. But at this time, so, they were struggling somewhat after yeah. the Euros. Yeah, the side was managed by Jose Torres famous for being part of the 1966 World Cup squad. For this match, Italy took the lead in the 40th minute when Paolo Rossi on the left side passed to the advancing Conti who went in and chipped the ball into the goal from a narrow angle. So, And in the 78th minute, Paolo Rossi would score from a penalty kick after he himself had been fouled in the box. I guess a straightforward win for Italy, but again, nothing impressive. No, nothing impressive, but let me say it's possibly the best last game of uh, the last best game of uh, Paolo Rossi and possibly his last goal with the Azzurri, if I, if I remember. Uh, you could be right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He never scored again. 
in the year going to the to the World Cup. So I think it was his last. And also, if you, I remember this goal because he went wide on the left and he really looked the Paolo Rossi of the late 70s when he was playing for Vicenza and Perugia because he started as a winger, not as a central striker. So he was extremely fast and he was able to really go on the left and then turning the, the, the ball to Bruno Conti to enter and, uh, you know, send a chop to the goalkeeper. It was, a, it was a great goal. The entire move was great by the team. You know, it seems a pretty stable team. And also, also and then Paulo Rossi scored as a, with a penalty kick. Also, because the, I remember the preparation, because we remember a few years before when Italy lost in a very bad way before the World Cup 82 against Portugal. So at this time, the, the preparation was really strong. It was possibly the Excuse best approach. Me, uh, uh, Franco, was that yeah, Portugal please. or was that... That was a club at Braga, right? It was No, that's, an, that's another game. Yeah, it was uh, uh, talking about a few months before. That's oh, Italy okay. versus Sporting Braga. One nil go by Francesco Graziani, I believe, uh, just before the World Cup. It was playing in Spain. Uh, let's say it was not an official game. Oh, clearly. right, right. Yes. So, and uh, it was a pretty strong team uh, and the approach uh, was uh, the right one in terms of mentality. Clearly, the result was great. Uh, some things were very good, uh, but again, we can say that during Bert's of time, Italy played well only during World Cup 78, World Cup 82. It was never, never a brilliant team. You know, you could see some brilliant games like when you had Bruno Conti in that way, Antonio Cabrini, Paolo Rossi and Alto Belli, but never played well on the Berzot, except for those that bunch of games uh, between uh, the two World Cups. We need to think about this. We may sound harsh, but there was the approach of also of Italian football at the time. It was very kind of uh, hard, defensive. Uh, it was coming from uh, the, all the victories of the 60s by Inter, and AC Milan uh, with Elenio Herrera and Nero Rocco that told to the country that playing a defensive uh, football was the best way for Italy to make it. Yeah, cut and Berzot was Berzot grew up as a coach in those years. That was the culture of our football. Everything changed a few years later with Arrigo Sacchi when he took over AC Milan. That was when Italian football culture changed. But if we look behind and we, we don't understand what was before, that's why then we say, oh, Italy wasn't playing well, it uh, wasn't convincing. It was never convincing. Honestly, if you look at how we approached the, the World Cup 82, the qualification games were horrible. Italy winning just one nil with Luxembourg. That was how Italy was playing those games. And that, then it was when uh, the legend started about Italy playing well only during official games. That's why we used to lose with Germany in the friendlies. We used to win always with the Germans in the official games was completely different approach, very bad during the friendlies. And also, and honestly, approaching World Cup 86, playing only friendlies uh, was really an extra problem. It showed to be a very big extra problem for Berzot. But this one at least was good. We come to the end of the season. And Italy were involved in a sort of a dress rehearsal for the following year. With there was no Confederation Cup. Yes, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have uh, this tournament, uh, Mexico hosting a tournament. This tournament was called Azteca 2000. And it's believed that initially this was a tournament that was supposed to involve four teams. Mexico the hosts, Italy, England, and Germany, who would play each other in a round robins type of a tournament. However, because of scheduling conflicts, Italy had to arrive early and depart early because of the last rounds of the Coppa Italia matches. And West Germany had to wait until the Bundesliga season was over because they could participate. So they missed each other, Italy and Germany. So instead, you had two tournaments, Azteca 2000 and Ciudad de Mexico Cup, whereby... Mexico and England would be in both quote unquote tournaments, while Italy would be in the Azteca 2000 and West Germany would only be in the Ciudad de Mexico Cup. They should have, I guess, planned that better or scheduled that better, but uh, this is how it was. So Italy and Germany missed each other. I never got a chance to play each other. So Italy would play two matches, well, I should say three 
matches, including a friend against a club side. So this was, again, seen as an opportunity. And we discussed this in our England podcast as well. This was seen as an opportunity to get acclimatized to the conditions that they would face the following year. It was a semi-official tournament. It was a nice test. But again, everyone who got there was somewhat exhausted. So, <laughs> Well, look, uh, one thing about this, uh, Sean, the weird thing of that season and why we didn't have the finals. You know, usually you have a final, you have just two teams involved in the final of the Italy Cup. Whatever was the, the team involved, that would have been a big issue. The problem is that the schedule of that season of the Coppa Italia was really weird because basically they played the quarterfinals, semifinals, and final of the of the cup. They played it from like 12 of June after the end of the of the championship. That's why you had like AC Milan, Fiorentina, Sampdoria, Inter, Verona, Torino, Parma, Juventus, all involved in the Italy Cup uh, tournament. That was the reason why you couldn't really send a, a team to a very full team to Mexico, or at least, and then that's why it's so the clubs were protesting, like saying, okay, if you had to send them, you have to come back earlier. So that's why usually you just have the final that's, you know, was never going to be a problem. By the way, that season, uh, Milan, AC Milan lost uh, in the final against Sampdoria. Sampdoria, yes. Yeah. Yes. I think yeah. it was their first trophy in their history, by the way. Yes. And yeah, they would win the Coppa Italia, I guess, many more times in the following years, the later 80s. For this tournament, Azteca 2000, Bierzot selected the following squad. He took as goalkeepers Ivana Bordon of Sampdoria, Giovanni Galli of Fiorentina, and Franco Tancredi of Roma. For defenders, he took Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Fulvio Colovati of Inter, Giuseppe Baresi of Inter, brother of Franco, Ubaldo Rieti of Roma, Antonio Cabrini of Juventus, Roberto Tricella of Verona, Gaetano Schire of Juventus, and Pietro Viercova of Sampdoria. For midfielders and forwards, he took Bruno Conti of Roma, Pietro Fana of Verona, Salvatore Bani of Napoli, Bruno Giordano of Lazio, Giuseppe Galderizzi of Verona, Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, Marco Tardel of Juventus, Giuseppe Dosan of Torino, Alessandro Altobelli of Inter, Paolo Rossi of Juventus, and Aldo Serena of Torino. Italy would play an unofficial friendly on May 29th at Puebla versus Mexican club Puebla. So for this match, Ivano Bordon was back in the squad for the first time since that friendly against West Germany in the previous year, May 22nd, 84. So he started in goal. He'd be replaced by Franco Tancredi of Roma in the 46th minute. So then you have Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Pietro Vierkovo of Sampdoria. And we should mention that this is the same day as the Heisel disaster, May 29th. So the Juventus contingent were absent from this match. Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, Pietro Vierkovo of Sampdoria, Capping the side, Fulvio Colovati of Inter. He'd be replaced by Roberto Tricella of Verona in the 46th minute and Ubaldo Rieti of Roma. Then you have Giuseppe Baresi of Inter. This was his first match with the team since 1981. You have Bruno Conti of Roma. He'd be replaced by Giuseppe Dosena of Torino in the 81st minute. Salvatore Bani of Napoli. Bruno Giordano of Lazio, he replaced by Giuseppe Galderizzi of Verona in the 46th minute. I guess this was his first unofficial cap. Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, Alessandro Altobelli of Inter, and he replaced by Pietro Fana of Verona in the 65th minute. We should mention that Tricera was sent off in the 86th minute in this match. Mexican side Puebla took the lead in the 16th minute through Romano. And Giuseppe Galderizzi would tie the match with a penalty kick in the 75th minute. Look, I would say there's not much to remember about this game. Only one thing, that tournament was the last chance for Ivano Bordon as a goalkeeper. And honestly, 
the goal that Puebla scored uh, is totally his fault. You know, he was late in exiting uh, from the post, uh, and it was one nil for Puebla. He played uh, just another game that with Mexico, and it was over. You know, his time with the national team was never. He was never doomed to be the first goalkeeper. Even when he played the Mundialito in 1980, he wasn't great. So he had a great career with uh, with Inter in the 70s. Uh, but it seems to be that his, his moment came in the 80s when he was past his prime, honestly. So it was, let's say, more apprised by Berzot, you know, to give him a, a last shot in this tournament. The tournament proper would be a few days later on June 2nd at Azteca Stadium in Mexico City as the Mexican hosts took on Italy. It was a matchup between the host and a defending champion. For this match, Ivano Bordon started in goal from Sampdoria. Like you mentioned, this was his 22nd and final cap for Italy. His first cap had been in 1978. He'd be replaced by Giovanni Galli of Fiorentina in the 46th minute. So you have Giuseppe Bergomi of Inter, capping the side Fulvio Colovati of Inter, Ubaldo Rieti of Roma, he replaced by Antonio Cabrini of the Juventus in the 67th minute. The Juventus contingent had joined the squad after the match in Heisel. But obviously, they were not fit enough to start this match. So then you have Roberto Tricella of Verona, Giuseppe Barresi of Inter, Bruno Conti of Roma. He replaced by Pietro Fana of Verona in the 63rd minute. Salvatore Bagni of Napoli, Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, he'd be replaced by Marco Tardelli of Juventus, 88th minute, Bruno Giordano of Lazio, he'd be replaced by Giuseppe Galderizzi of Verona in the 46th minute. So I guess this is his first official cap. Uh, Alessandro Altobelli of Inter, he'd be replaced by Giuseppe Dosena of Torino in the 78th minute. And I'll quickly go through the Mexico lineup. You have Pablo Larios of Cruz Azul. In fact, he passed away about two years ago. You have Francisco Chavez of Universidad Autonoma de Guadalajara, or TECOS. Rafael Amador of UNAM. He replaced by Raul Servin of UNAM in the 46th minute. Carlos Munoz of Universidad Autonoma de Nueva León, Tigres. Armando Manzo of Club America, Felix Cruz Barbosa of UNAM, Miguel Espana of UNAM, capping the side, Thomas Boy of University of Nueva León, the Tigres. He replaced by Alejandro Dominguez of Club America, 75th minute. Luis Flores of UNAM, he replaced by Javier Hernandez of University Autonoma de Guadalajara. In the 46th minute, of course, he's the father of Chicharito. You have Javier Aguirre of America. He replaced by Carlos de los Cobos of America in the 86th minute. And Manuel Negrete of UNAM in a side managed by Bora Milotinovic. Also, we should mention this was Giuseppe Barres's first official match since 1981 and against East Germany. So for this match... Mexico would take the lead in a 45th minute. Manuel Negrete would take a corner from the right and Aguirre would score with a near post header. Yeah, of it course, seemed to be a goal directly from the, from the side. Well, yes. uh, yeah, to, uh, I remember because the, we had a very bad speaker. You know, it was a very old guy. They used to get all the names wrong. He lasted until... Uh, just a, a month before the World Cup 86, and I remember everybody cheering to get a new one. Because, <laughs> and he got, you know, for I remember that he kept saying, Oh, the goal was scored by Negrete. By Negrete, no, it was Aguirre that just touched the ball with his head. And we should mention Aguirre has since managed the Mexican national team and Atletico Madrid and has had a solid career as a manager since. And oh, hold on, we forget that that year, Hugo Sanchez was the most prolific uh, scorer in La Liga yes. with Atletico Madrid. And yes. that summer, I think uh, he 
yeah, yeah in Real July Madrid, he moved yeah. to Real Madrid from Atletico, yes. but yes. it wasn't he wasn't there for the for the tournament. Yes, and we also mentioned about the Juventus players not starting and joining the squad late because of the Heizel disaster, and this is always in the background. One thing from a technical side, uh, here you start to see the equivocal created by Berzot with Tricella playing as Libero without Shirea and Baresi as a central midfielder. You see that one thing that Berzot never liked was real competition for a place in the, in the team. In 1982, he decided not to call Roberto Pruzzo to avoid issues to Paolo Rossi. In 1986, he called Paolo Rossi just to give back in some way, to be, but not to give any issue to Galderisi because Rossi was over. Everybody knew it and didn't call Pruzzo again. But even here, Shirea, Berzot knew that he was starting to go down. He plays Tricella. He doesn't play Baresi because he knew that if Baresi started as a libero, he could really compete against Shirea. He was always against this. He has this idea, I have my group, my team, my man, they are the ones playing. Mm. I don't want people fight for a slot in the team, which competition always helps. And in this case, we see that it would have helped. Italy would tie the match in the 54th minute. Galderizzi struck a volley that would hit the post and Di Gennaro would take the rebound, get around one defender and struck with a low shot. It was a diplomatic tie, we should say, for the host and the defending champion. Also, this match was the last cap for Ubaldo Rieti. This was his eighth and final cap. After this, he was out of national team contention. And it was not going to be missed, I can yes. tell you. <laughs> Neither by the Azzurri, but nor by S. Roma. As I told you before, he seemed to be a very promising player. He never blossomed as a top player, honestly. Then we come to the final match of the season. That, Ooh. as I mentioned, that we have already discussed in our England podcast. On June 6th, at Azteca, Italy took on England. This match took two weeks. I guess it was like a week or two weeks before, after yeah. Heisel tragedy. Still, yeah. And it was the first meeting, I guess, between Italians and English players since. For this match, there were some changes. So Bordon was out of contention. So Giovanni Galli of Fiorentina started the match. And he'd be replaced by Franco Tancredi of Roma in the 46th minute. We mentioned that Rieti was also out. So we have defensive formation of Giuseppe Bergomo of Inter, Pietro Viercovo of Sampdoria, captain the side Fulvio Colovati of Inter, he replaced by Antonio Cabrini of Juventus in the 46th minute, Roberto Tricella of Verona, Giuseppe Baresi of Inter, Bruno Conti of Roma, he replaced by Pietro Fana of Verona in the 46th minute, Salvatore Bani of Napoli, Antonio Di Gennaro of Verona, Giuseppe Galderizzi of Verona, and he replaced by Marco Tardelli of Juventus, 84th minute, and Alessandro Altobelli of Inter. So, and also after, in the second half, obviously when Colovati left, Antonio Cabrini was the captain. For England, you have the following lineup. Peter Shilton of Southampton, Gary Michael Stevens of Everton, Kenny Sansom of Arsenal, Mark Wright of Southampton, Terry Butcher of Ipswich, Trevor Stephen of Everton, he'd be replaced by Glenn Hoddle of Tottenham in the 63rd minute, capping the side Brian Robson of Manchester United, Ray Wilkins of AC Milan in Italy, Trevor Francis of Sampdoria, he'd be replaced by Gary Lineker of Leicester in the 78th minute, Mark Hatley of AC Milan, or as he was called, Attila in Italy, and Chris Waddle of Newcastle, and he replaced by John Barnes of Watford in the 69th minute, side managed by Bobby Robson. So this match would come to life towards the end. This is a very tight match, very poor quality. And we may have mentioned this in our England uh, podcast. A France manager, Henri Michel, 
was in the stands, I guess, scouting. And he described this match as very mediocre quality, as did most of the observers. Neither side impressed because of the heat and the altitude conditions. It only came to life in the 73rd minute when Salvatore Bani gave Italy the lead. He got fault. Yes. So he got the ball on the right side at the edge of the box. And it looked like he attempted to cross it. But Peter Shilton misjudged the trajectory of the ball and it chipped over him into the net. If I may, Paul, you might remember another similar goal that another <laughs> England GK goalkeeper got in a World Cup. <laughs> Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> Quite similar, by the way. Very similar. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, just a couple of minutes later, England tied a match from a typical John Barnes cross from the left and a Mark Haitley header. The match seemed to be headed for a tie when in the last minute, Gary Stevens appeared to have fouled Pietro Vierkovo in the box. Sorry to interrupt you. Why you say appear to foul? <laughs> because the, <laughs> you know, former Sampdoria Yugoslavian coach, Bucadim Boskov, used to say, goal is when the referee blows the whistle. So in that case, the referee blew the whistle. So it was a fault <laughs> and then a penalty kick. <laughs> well, uh, many felt it was kind of a harsh decision. That's what I tried to say. I saw it like, really, no, just kidding. But I saw it like five times because I was curious about it. You don't really see it. You don't really understand if it was. So what I can tell you is that Pietro Vierco, there was not, it's not a striker. It's one of the fastest players ever who ever played in Serie A. And it's, it's no one that likes to fall because that's not, that's not his game. You know, it's not Paolo Rossi used to do that a lot. People inside used to do that a lot. Not Pietro Vierco. So let me say, at least he was touched. That's for sure. And you know, when you get touched in that place, you fall and it's penalty kick. That's nothing you can do about it. Yes. And Alto Belli would score the winning kick in the 89th minute. And Italy won the match to end the season. And it's also true that in the last 20 minutes, Italy was better. Also because he had, it had already played one game. It was more the altitude. Uh, you know, you, they were already there for a week. Uh, so it was it was a bad, it was an advantage for Italy having played already a game at that uh, that altitude. Uh, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah. So if you look at the season strictly based upon the results, one would say that it was perhaps a satisfactory season, but that doesn't take into account many of the points that you have raised as far as players being selected because they have always been selected. And the new blood, which is provided by the Verona contingent, isn't... Even Torino. Even Torino, yes, yes. Isn't enough to show any significant progress, even though it is, based upon the results, it is somewhat of a progress compared to like the 82-83 season, let's say. Yeah, we started to renew the team in some way, but... I remember Marco Tardelli a few years ago was on TV because it was always something that I had on my mind. Because, you know, when you're like a kid, you remember everything that you see on TV, you read on the media. So, and I've seen a few years ago, Marco Tardelli talking about those years. And he was asked about, uh, like, do you think that Enzo Berzot never made mistakes? Because he's a hero. He's called the Vecho, the old guy. And he said, look, he made mistakes, but we did too, we players. Me and others of the old guards, we should have told him, look, go for the new guys. Because we are, we are over. Because he was too grateful to us to send us home. And he kept calling us. We did whatever we could, but we were over. That's what Mar- Marco Tardelli said. You know what? Yes. <laughs> In the summer of 85, this Juventus contingent was a spent force. And in fact... Tardelli, Rossi were offloaded to AC Milan and Inter. Claudio Gentile was already to Fiorentina? Yes, the year before, yes. But, you know, there was the same problem with Juventus. 
after Michel Platini was over, it was never they were never able to renew the team, and it took them a while. Yes, to, nearly to a decade. Yeah. Winning, winning again uh, the championship. Yes, they won a UEFA Cup uh, and uh, Italy Cup with Dino Zoff, but it was just one shot. Yeah. yeah. So even with when they started to buy uh, players like uh, Roberto Baggio, Paolo Di Canio, Toto Schillaci, it took them years to get back to be the real Juventus. Yes. So we, uh, they had to wait for Marcello Lippi. Would you say this was partly as well this season as a lack of real top-level players who were coming into the team, that the replacements for the players who were maybe past their prime, as you've said, none of them have really gone on to be top-level players, international players. Banyi is maybe one of the most successful who's established himself this season, but there's not too many who've really been top international players from this crop that are being introduced no they were not and also I believe that the few ones who had the chance to really raise the technical level of the Azzurri team uh, were not really considered or given a real chance by Enzo Berzot and I give you really two names which are Bruno Giordano possibly one of the best strikers for 10 years and the other Giuseppe Dossena possibly the best regista of those years and at the same time today we know that once you win you need to change because players lose like some of their capacity looking for a victory. There were young kids that were doing great, both in Serie A and with the under-21, which it was not like today. And under-21 at the time was ready for top-level football. And people like Bialy Mancini, they were in the first 11 with Sampdoria, so they could have played at that level. Roberto Donadori, the same. Giuseppe Giannini, the same. Okay, you had Dosena. So you had the chance to replace... Uh, the old senators with new blood, with some other, with a lot of experience, both at national, international level. Obviously, we were not going to win the, the World Cup 86. And let me tell you that Italy was not even the best team in World Cup 82. It was not the strongest one. Brazil was a lot better, let me tell you, on paper. We all know that. We had a great streak of games. For those games, Italy was the best, but it was not the best team on the field. It was not going to be the best on the field, even in, uh, in Mexico. But let me say that what we are going to see in 86 is a, a sad team. Even the players did not believe in themselves. Nobody believed in that team. And even Berzot didn't believe in them in the end because we are going to see, I believe, next time that in the final game against France that eliminated Italy from the World Cup, instead of Di Gennaro, a regista is going to play Giuseppe Baresi, a defensive midfielder with the... Only one idea. Oh, we need to stop Michel Platini. That means you're completely quitting the game. That, okay, we're, we've always been a defensive team, but not so defensively. Because if you look back at even uh, Inter and AC Milan in the 60s, uh, or Juventus in the 70s and 80s, they were great in defense, but they were great in attack as well. Never fully offensive, but they were great in attack, and they never quit the game before starting the game. That's what happened with Berzot when he really realized when he was in Mexico that the team was not uh, at the right level anymore. Also because even Bruno Conti was over in 86. 85 was his uh, last great season as a player with his, uh, as Roma. And without him, with his imagination on the field, yeah. there was nothing left of the world champions of 82, honestly. The only player who actually improved and grew in stature is like his Alessandro Altobelli. Yeah. He's the only one who started scoring regularly, even post-86. At the Euro 88, he yeah. was great there as well. I would say that he had a great 10 years. And uh, obviously, in uh, from 1980, when he won uh, the Scudetto with Inter, he got stuck because he had first uh, Paolo Rossi and Giordano, they were the best in the late 70s. And then he got Roberto Bettega and Francesco Graziani. So they were, especially in Bettega in 1980, it was great. Then in 82, we got Paolo Rossi back and uh, Francesco Graziani again. It was the perfect shoulder for Paolo Rossi. Then finally, it was his time. But you know what? Paolo Rossi was not the best partner for him because uh, Altobelli had to stay as a central striker. And Paolo Rossi was not able anymore to play on the wings. It was not fast anymore as he used to be in the late 70s. So let's say that the mix wasn't great. That's why I keep saying that Bruno Giordano was the ideal partner 
for uh, Alessandro Altobelli because also Jordan was great in uh, making assists as he was going to show in Napoli together with Maradona and Careca. And in fact, Jordan was not going to score so many goals anymore. He, he was a top scorer, I believe, in 1979, but he has not scored so many goals anymore because he moved a little bit back more as, a, as an assist man. But that's, you know, looking back, uh, doing the what-if game, we love it, but it never really works. <laughs> the greatest takeaway is basically that the, the Rossi's and the Cardelli, Colovati, Shirea, yeah. even Shirea. They're all getting old, but Bierzot still maintains loyalty to them. And a mistake about the goalkeeper. It's also true that none of them was at soft level. Walter Zenga was still ready and Stefano Tacconi was going for his first year with Juventus. Bordon was over. Tancredi, he was never a top goalkeeper in his career. He had a very good season, obviously, with S. Roma, but also physically wasn't great. Giovanni Galli, despite He was winning, a solid yeah, goalkeeper throughout his career. Yeah, but you know what? If you look at what he did in the friendly, so also in, in preparation to the World Cup, and then during the World Cup, he made mistakes. He made bad mistakes. And uh, let me say that he did some mistakes with the Simulan later as well. So again, he was a high-level goalkeeper, not the top goalkeeper that needed. And you know, this uncertainty created a problem to these goalkeepers as well. One thing, especially at the time, today we are used to have one goalkeeper like for the championship, another one for the cups. Uh, it's quite normal. It's to rotate, over. yeah. The rotation. At the time, you have one goalkeeper. Usually the number 12 didn't see the field for the entire season. Right, right. And sometimes they, he was played only at the last game of the season just to, <laughs> to let him mm. have uh, his name uh, as part of the possible the winning team of that season. It was bad for both Tancredi and Galli to be in that uncertainty that was going to be resolved only in 1986, in the 85-86 season, going towards the World Cup. But based upon this season that we can tell that obviously the goalkeeper position has not been resolved. But as far as the defense, it's just going to be like just Bergomi, Cabrini, Vierkovic, Shira. That's just going to be defensive no matter what. Yep. Then... Conti and Tardelli, I guess, if fit, will be in midfield. Bani, Bani is definitely a starter now. It's and, Bani instead of Tardelli as a yes. defensive midfielder. And Di Gennaro is set as the register at this point. And, and now we got the other problem, which is all the times that Berzon decided to play Franco Baresi in that role. So you were like missing a real midfielder or even Vierkovod as a fifth because it was very fast. He was able to play both advancing in midfielder like that day against England. So you could find him on the other side of the field or as a fifth uh, defender. There was really another problem that Berzot was never able to solve in those years. Right. And what Altobelli is certainty up front, Rossi at the end of this season, it's, it's a bit shaky, his position in the squad. Yeah. So he tries first Giordano and then Galderisi. And Galderisi stays uh, until the World Cup because he had, honestly, had a great season in Serie A, right. but at international level, uh, also physically. When you were playing with uh, teams like England, Germany, physically, you need, you need another level of player. Unless you're, you're Bruno Conti or Maradona, then you can play against everybody. But as a striker, that size uh, was not adapted anymore. Do you remember if Ancelotti was injured that season? Yeah, yeah. He so that's why he season, and then he was out from the from the from the national team as well. Right. And it was its uh, his second bad injury, and that was the reason why the other year it was going to be sold by as Roma in the last day of the Calcio Mercato to AC Milan. And I remember he was paid just about let me say the equivalent at the time of in dollars three millions something like that, so almost nothing at least for a champion like him, but uh, voices in Rome was, were like, oh, he's broken, he's over, whatever. He became a star again with, uh, with the Similan. We all remember his goal uh, from very far away against Real Madrid oh, yes, in uh, yes. the Champions Cup. Yes. With Buyo still looking for the, still looking for the ball. <laughs> yes. What do you think, Paul, in general, about the season? 
Yeah, I think there's a, a again still the the transition that's that's being dragged out almost from the 1982 team, as as Franco said, the Bears' loyalty to to those players maybe cost the national team, but also it's very difficult to to shape a a competitive team and a winning team when you're only playing friendlies. So that was another disadvantage really for this this team going into 1986 at a time when maybe they'd have found out more about those players by playing through qualifiers that is is just two years of friendlies. So it's it's a difficult period to build a successful team. But obviously they're still in terms of results, very hard to beat and winning games. It's probably easier to look back and say that the 1986 team underperformed and the changes should have been made. But at the time the results maybe were there and it just needs the, the, some of the changes to be made earlier. After the World Cup, the young players with Vicini, they excelled and everyone was saying, where were these young players at the time and so on and so forth. But perhaps they were not ready yet or, but you said they were ready. So who knows? It's easy to say that Donadoni would have been ready in 85 as he was in 86, 87, but those few years makes a difference. But you well, know, another, a couple of players, we have to say that it's true. It was a transition time, Verona winning, but it was not like Lazio 1974, which had a, an entire Italian team, uh, which like six, seven players would have played in the national team. All the best Verona players were called in. Tricella, Di Gennaro, Pietro Fanna. It's not that Verona was able to really provide the, the national team with other top players because, like, goalkeeper Garella, 30 years old, was totally a surprise. It was really bad previously. Other guys were quite old, like Volpati, Fontolana, right? very Luciano experienced, Marangone. honest players. Luciano Marangone, it was a left back. You had Antonio Gabrini. You didn't need uh, Luciano Marangone. So, Luciano Bruni... It was a great, it was a great team, but not made a great player. Plus two champions like Preben Elkir and Hans Peter Brigel. So that, that's why. Let me say that a couple of players that were neglected, especially we'll, we will talk about it uh, when we'll face uh, next season, are two Juventus players, which are Massimo Mauro, which you could play both as a regista and as a um, winger, will be the perfect replacement for Bruno Conti. The, oh, by the way, the only play, Italian player who played with Maradona, Zico, and Platini yes. in his career. And the other, that was really neglected, but for other reasons, is Lionello Manfredonia. Former Lazio player, was part of the team that went to Argentina 78. He had a, some kind of a fight with Enzo Berzot. He was never called again. But I'll tell you that from 1982 83, when he was back together with Giordano after the Calcio Scommessi scandal, He's been the best first defender and then central midfielder as a mediano that Serie A. So he went to Juventus. He won the Scudetto in 1986. He won the, the Intercontinental Cup with the Juventus. He was great until 80, for other three years. That's exactly the kind of tough player that you needed together with uh, Salvador Ibagni in the midfield. Those are, there wasn't that much other players that you could call aside from the young kids of uh, Vicini. And again, Roberto Donadoni, both regista and winger. Giuseppe Giannini, regista, he was going to be there on the, the World Cup 90. Roberto Mancini, that could play instead of uh, Galderisi or even Giordano in that case. And by the way, he was going to be called, uh, at least once I think, uh, he was called in 84, late 84, by Berzot and Bialli, but Bialli, watch out at the time, wasn't really playing as a central striker. Sometimes he used to play as a winger. He was not still a complete player, but they were all already experienced and they won the Coppa Italia that year. So there was some material that was going to grow for the World Cup 90. And let me tell you that with the cycle that was going to the World Cup 90, Italy started the best cycle of its history because it's a cycle that starts in 1990 it ends in 2006 with people like Roberto Baggio, Maldini, those players. They start in those years and they end in, the, in 2006, the, the 16 years of Azzurri's time. 
And if you think about it, you can connect it to 982. So you fail only one World Cup in the middle, 78, 82 to 2006. Italy was possibly the strongest team in the world together with Brazil. It will happen again, unfortunately. Football is a strange game, so we'll see. <laughs> you know, you're liking the, now you're liking the basic material, the raw material. Uh, just give you, you know, maybe I know it's anecdotal. Close by my house, there's a huge park. When I was a kid, I was out of school, 1.30, we were all on the field in the park. Tens, if not hundreds of kids playing. And if you arrived there like at 2 o'clock, it was full. If you go today, there's nobody. And now, even at youth level, unfortunately, why the United States realizing that the pain method, it was wrong, allowing only rich kids to play football. Now you're having Italy going the other way. Until you're 14, you likely have to pay to play, which is totally wrong. That's why you don't really see the sons of immigrants starting playing football at a high level in Italy, even if now we are starting to have a big immigration and it's been like that for 20 years. That's one of the reasons. And that's why you're starting to see so many sons of former players. It didn't happen at the time. When you have a the son of a player like Maldini was something completely, and by the way, Maldini was a champion, a lot better than his father. Today, you, you can count them. There, Chiesa, the Maldini, there are several, even the son of Mancini played at a certain moment. Too many sons. Why? Because they had the advantage. An advantage that you couldn't use it at the time because the competition was so strong. You have so many hundreds of players, group level players, that if you are just the son of somebody, you couldn't find a slot in a team. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying now we're missing the raw material in Italy. Yeah, I think the grassroots football is a problem everywhere, Franco. You see it here in England as well. You don't see kids playing in the same way. I know there's the academy system, but it isn't. It isn't the same for, the, as you say, the raw material of, of kids playing the game. But but see France and Germany. See, they got it well. They integrated the immigrants, the sons of the immigrants. And that's, well, France was never good until 1984. And it was just because of Platini. Then it was the sons of the immigrants. If you see that France, they won the World Cup in 98. I think six, seven, eight of them coming from some other place in Africa, one way or the other. So the same for Germany. They integrated everybody. Yeah. The difference with the academy that Spain got it in the right way. Only Spain got it in the right way. That you have a bunch of young Spanish kids that grew up together. We need to see how their transition will work. Because I'm not that sure. Because if you see Spain today, it doesn't look good for the next 10 years. They had a, this age of champions. Now they have a good team, obviously. But it's like, let me say, it's a little bit like Italy. You still have the top teams like Real Madrid and Barcelona. But in terms of national teams, you got some good players. But the, those, that era of champions is over. But this is a, a talk for another age. Yes. We are still stuck in the 80s. Yes. And for our next podcast with you, we will discuss this 1986 Mexico World Cup adventure in detail. Once again, we'd like to thank Mr. Franco Spicciarelli for his participation in this series. I always say we learn so much more after our discussions, so many insights that you provide for having lived the football there. So we always thank you. And uh, always feel free to leave questions and comments for any questions and comments you may contact me on my blog or on facebook i'm under soccer nostalgia on twitter i'm at sp1873 mr paul will can be contacted on his blog the 1888 letter and on twitter he's at 1888 letter you may also follow the podcast on spotify under soccer nostalgia talk podcast Mr. Spicciarello can be contacted on Twitter at S P I C C I A R. At you can read it there. Yes, there it is. <laughs> yeah. So once again, thank you. 
Thank you for hosting me. Thank you, Paul. Always great to discuss how Italy beats England. If it's going to happen again. <laughs> and I don't want to thank you for one thing, Shaham, because when you say you leave that football, you make me feel old. So, but anyway, it was the best time. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Franco. Thank you.